This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. When we came under your command, Colonel, you stated very clearly that we would never find Negroes who could pass a pilot's exam, make it through flight school, survive basic combat. We've done all of that. I don't believe your boys have scored a single aerial kill. It's damn hard to shoot down the enemy 100 miles behind the front lines. We have a right to fight for our country, the same as every other American. We will not go away. I can't afford the kind of losses my bomber's been suffering. Can you help save lives? If you get us new planes, we can help your boys. Nothing's difficult. Everything's a challenge. Through adversity to, to the, the stars. stars. From the last plane to the last bullet to the last minute to the last man, we fight. 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 At all costs, you protect the heavies. Fighters, four o'clock. Stay with the bombers. One bomber, that's ten men. We count our victories by the bombers we get to their targets. By the husbands we return to their wives. By the fathers we get back to their children. Come on, Junior, fail! That was a trailer for the new George Lucas blockbuster, Red Tails. It's the Hollywood story of the Tuskegee Airmen, the Negro flymen who demonstrated by their character and that their actions that they not only were good enough, but better than those who looked down, who denigrated them as people and as professionals, simply because of their skin color. Here with me is one of the famous Tuskegee Airmen, Captain Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., the commander of one of the squadrons, which is the focus of Red Tails. Roscoe was a hot pilot, a flying ace. He was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross and was one of 15 U.S. pilots who shot down the advanced German jet fighters. After the war, Roscoe received his master's degree and doctorate from NYU, where he was the director of the Afro-American Affairs Institute and a professor of education for 27 years. In 1977, Dr. Brown was named president of CUNY's Bronx Community College, where he served until 1993. Roscoe is currently the director of the Center for Urban Education Policy at the CUNY Graduate Center and host of African American Legends, produced and aired here on CUNY TV. In 2007, in a ceremony in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda, Professor Brown and other Tuskegee Airmen were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal in recognition, belated though it was, of their service. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your character. It's an honor. Well, anytime we can talk about Tuskegee Airmen, it's an honor for me to be able to do it. I don't have many heroes, but here you are. Let's talk. First of all, you're all over the place. You're on TV. You're on radio. You're in newspapers. You're in magazines. What's your life been like since Red Tails? Well, actually, I was a consultant for the movie when they shot the movie, and I've been a consultant with them on their marketing plan. And the marketing plan was to make a penetration into the African-American community so that African-Americans would be able to see it, and then white Americans would hear about it. And as a result, it's been very successful. The first week, they did $20 million. The second week, they did uh, $11 million. So they, it's on the move. And because I am so committed to the story, I'm very pleased to be able to be all over the place doing those kind of interviews because, unfortunately, the general public does not know as much about the Tuskegee Airmen as they should. 
Of course, the general public doesn't know as much about racial segregation as they should because fortunately most of the people who are alive now didn't grow up under se racial segregation. But as I tell people, r racial segregation was a fact of life. When you deal with a fact of life, you know what you have to do. Our job as African Americans who were educated and trying to move up was to be excellent. The Tuskegee Airmen started out to be excellent and ended up to be even more excellent because of the discipline and the training that we got. So it's very important that the general public understand that this is a mark of excellence. I frequently say that the success of the Tuskegee Airmen in World War II in aviation where they thought blacks couldn't function, and the success of Jackie Robinson in Major League Baseball where blacks had been excluded even though they had the talent, helped to change the mindset of America so that when the Brown case uh, desegregating schools came forth, there was a 9 nothing vote in favor of desegregation. Now, true, it took them 16 years to actually implement mm. that, but the fact is that we have implemented many of those things. Right now, however, we need to get people's awareness that we have barriers to overcome, that we overcame them, we overcame them by excellence, and particularly I want young African-American children to know this because some of them have been stereotyped is only being in music and sport. And we know that African Americans do anything that anybody else did. They have the same normal curve of probability of talent, and they ought to be given a chance. And that's why I like talking about this movie and what it means. Okay, how did you get involved with the movie? George Lucas produces the movie, funds the movie. How does Roscoe Brown get involved in the movie? Uh, for years, many people have known I was a Tuskegee Airman, even though my career was in education. And back in the 80s, Tony Brown did a documentary on PBS called Lonely Eagles, mm -hmm. which I and Percy Sutton and Lee Arch and Ben Davis appeared on. Lucas saw that. He began to be interested in the Tuskegee Airmen. He came to our organization, gave us some money to help us do some more research. And finally, by 2005, he said, well, look, we're going to do this. And so he invited several of us out to the Skywalker Ranch so that we could talk about our stories and talk about what we thought might be in the movie. And out of that, they asked me and Lee Arch and Bill Holloman to be consultants. In 2009, I went to Prague, where they were actually shooting the movie, mm -hmm. where they recreated the Tuskegee Airmen Air Base uh, on an old Russian jet strip. And I was there, and I helped to educate train the pilots and how fighter pilots walk, talked, and acted. And so when you see them in the cockpit, you've seen the result of my instruction. Okay, and, and, and some of the interviews that you've done, both with Terrence Howard and with other stars in the film, they talk about sort of the juice that you delivered in terms of the attitude. I mean, you used the word to describe yourself in the NPR interview as cocky. Mm -hmm. Talk about cocky pilots. Talk about hot pilots. Well, first of all, I used the term hot pilot on one show and nobody knew what it meant because that's a time-dated thing. But a hot pilot is a pilot who is very daring, very courageous, and does things like going close to the ground, turn upside down, or flying under bridges. We all were hot pilots. I was maybe a little bit better than many of them, but basically the cockiness was confidence. To know about the Tuskegee Airmen story, you have to know that when they decided to have the Tuskegee Airmen, they, uh, as a result of the pressure of the NAACP and the black press, they went to the colleges, mainly the black colleges, but many of the white colleges, and chose the most athletic, the best students, the best leaders, and the ones who could deal with competition. So when you bring 3,000 highly competent people together, you know you're going to get talent. Uh, only about a thousand, not only, but a thousand graduated. But I say that of the two thousand who didn't graduate, if they'd been white in the white training, they all would have graduated, with a few exceptions who actually couldn't fly, because there was a quota system. There were only so many spots, so there's a lot of competition among us. And as you know from Super Bowl and others, competition brings out mm -hmm. uh, interaction. You talk about how good you are, and uh, someone said that uh, we were arrogant. Uh, my comment on that is we were cocky, but we were good, and we knew we could do it. 
And so therefore, our challenge was to be the best we can, and our competition was among each other. Because you put the best of the black community together, you're going to have outstanding people. If they took the best of the white community, as they did with the astronauts, you're going to have outstanding people. But you people. guys had the right stuff. Mm -hmm. Of course, yes. Absolutely. Well, African Americans have always had the right stuff. You can go to the Revolutionary War, you go to the War of 1812, you go to the Civil but you War. you couldn't prove to, it. Yeah. Oh, we proved it. No, no, I the mean fact in, in is the context that of... The white society didn't right. want us to right. prove it because of racial segregation. Uh, racial segregation has been a millstone around the neck of America. And it's only after the uh, Civil Rights Act that the country really began to grow as it has grown. And now we see that uh, about 45 to 35% of the country is minority. Uh, in 2040, half of the country would be people of color. So we can't go back to this white only thing. And that's what the Tuskegee Airmen was about, proving that African Americans can do anything that anybody else did and do it as well or better. And in a sense, it was the first successful battle in the modern civil rights movement. I mean, it preceded Jackie Robinson by three years. And watching the film and reading about it and knowing you, there were a lot, there was a lot of Jackie Robinson, in a sense, in you folks as well, the physical excellence, but also mm -hmm. the ability to tolerate what a lot of us would f have found absolutely intolerable situations, which are touched on in the movie. Yeah, you know, well, the fact is, you really had no alternative. If you had struck back and so on, they ended the, the uh, experiment, we wouldn't have had the opportunity. So when you know you're breaking barriers, you have to see how far you can go. And collectively, we were able to go very, very far. Uh, I tell an, uh, about an incident at Walterboro, South Carolina, where we were doing our combat training before going overseas. We were flying P-47s then. And when we got to the base, we went to the theater. The theater had a sign, white here, black here. And the black, whites were behind, blacks were behind the whites. So we went down intentionally and sat in the first row. The commander came and said, you can't sit here because the theater is for, this is for white only. You're back there. We'll put you in the first. And so some of us said, the government has spent $75,000 each training us. I'm sure they wouldn't want us to go to jail for establishing our, our constitutional rights. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. When we came back tomorrow, the sign was gone. We had integrated that theater because of pressure. And that's the kind of thing that's going on now. That's what Occupy Wall Street mm -hmm. is doing today. So you're in Tuskegee, Alabama. Where are you coming from? Where were you born? Where did you grow up and how did you I, get I was down there? born and grew up in Washington, D.C. My father was in Roosevelt's Black Cabinet with Mary McLeod Bethune, mm -hmm. Robert Weaver, and those folks. He was in charge of health for blacks all over the country. I lived three blocks from Howard University. I spent a lot of my time on the Howard University campus. When I graduated from high school, I went to Springfield College in Massachusetts, where I studied uh, sports medicine, exercise physiology, and physical education. And the day I graduated from Springfield College, I left to go to Tuskegee to be a trainee to become a pilot. And I graduated from uh, Tuskegee Army Air School in March of 44. In April of 44, by August of 44, rather, I was flying combat over Europe. I flew 68 combat missions right to the end of the war. So when I came back in October, I went back to graduate school. And you got a master's degree and a PhD. Mm -hmm. But what about jobs? Why not a commercial airline pilot when you get back? Well, when I came back, I was intended to go either medical school or get my PhD. But in the interim, I wanted to fly for the airlines because I really liked to fly. So I went to Eastern Airlines on Fifth Avenue and filled out an application with my thousand hours and all my awards. And I had left my New York Times and I went back as I was going out the door and the secretary was throwing the application in the wastebasket. She was red faced and she said to my face, we don't hire Negroes here. When I tell that to young people today and older people like you, they uh, stand, that would never happen today but at that time, people could tell you that, and it wasn't a damn thing you could do about it. So with that in mind, I went and worked for the Welfare Department, and then I went to coach and teach at West Virginia State College for two years, during which I coached the first black to play in the NBA, Earl Lloyd. 
So when that was over, then I went to NYU. How many careers have you had? About five or six different and, careers. And by, what's your latest career? You know, My latest career is mainly focusing on psychometrics and the evaluation of uh, academic performance. I'm on the Technical Advisory Committee for the New York State Education Department that develops the math and science tests for the schools. You are my hero. I'm, Go ahead. And I'm also working on assembling my archives about things that I've done because in my generation, when you were the first, people would write about it. And in many instances, I was the first to black to do something. Fortunately today, we don't have to talk about the first black. We just talk about those who are rich and famous. Now, what we want to do is to move rich and fame from sports and entertainment to finance and business and education and medicine. Mm -hmm. And proportionally, there are far more black professionals in areas like education and medicine and law and architecture than there are in sports and entertainment. But that's America. The sport and entertainment people are probably more famous than their local uh, congressman, their local senator. If you ask most people who their senator is, half of them wouldn't know. Probably. Probably. Who's your senator in New York State? Oh, wait a second. <laughs> I do know. Come on. Okay. So George Lucas gets this idea 23 years ago. He goes to the studios with this idea, and what? Well, actually, there's another story behind this. Tell me. Um, back in the late 70s, Lee Archer and I were working with Gordon Parks, the famous filmmaker right. who made the film Shaft and yep. so on. And we had a script which we developed and it went to MGM. And MGM was going to consider it, but then the head of the studio got fired and it got dropped. So it was a gap of about maybe 10 years where one of my wingmen, Bob Williams, wrote a story called The Tuskegee Gammon, which became an HBO movie special right. in 1995. With Lawrence that's, Fishman. That's a that's good movie. That's about the time when Lucas began to get interested. He said he wanted to make an action movie. One of the problems about making an action movie is the cost of the airplanes. Because even though the HBO Tuskegee Gammon talked about our struggles to become pilots and to be there, it didn't have much in the way of air to air because that's very expensive. Mm -hmm. Because Lucas has this digital laboratory and he can do anything based on the Star Wars technology. He wanted to do a film, as he said, he wanted to film about heroes, not about victims. Because when you talk about civil rights, in many ways, African Americans were victims. We overcame that mm -hmm. victimhood. But what he wanted to make in the film is heroes. Some people criticize the film because it does not talk about how we got to be where we are. But he has produced a documentary entitled Double Victory that's an hour and a half that talks with interviews and film footage about exactly how we got started and where we ended up. Excellent. And yeah, because one of, one of the critiques was that, in a sense, you've got the making of the movie, but you don't have the prequel mm -hmm. and you don't have the sequel. And we know. George Lucas does prequels and sequels. Yeah, is, he, is there a prequel in the works by him or by somebody? Yeah, he's talking about that. He said, Spike Lee said he might be interested in doing that. Um, being in the entertainment business, I've done consulting on a couple of movies, developing a script is not as easy as sitting there looking at it. Uh, he, he did one thing. He had an all-black cast with the exception of the whites who were the... Um, antagonistic general, one was a, favor, a favorable general, and the Italian girl that had the relationship. That was it. Was, it was all black was cast it, but, otherwise. And outstanding actors, Terrence oh. Howard, Cuba Gooding, Nate Parker, David Aliowo, uh, Elijah Kelly. Uh, excellent. Great actors. And, and Terrence Howard was fabulous in the movie, and also his Tavis Smiley interview about the movie, which he talks mm -hmm. about you giving them directions on how to, you know, tuck in their belts <laughs> and where, you know, how to get into the cockpit were really, you know, eye openers in terms of the the making the making of the movie. Let's go to the movie itself. You are sitting in the theater the first time you see. The whole movie. Mm -hmm. What's you're sitting there? What are you, what are you feeling? What are you thinking? Well, I was thinking because I knew how they changed the script that they had done a good job. The, the original script starts with the generals talking about whether we should be in the air. The movie actually, no, as you know, starts with a bombing raid over Germany with the bombers being blown up and the fighters it's, not it's, protecting it's, them. It's, it's, so that set the tone for the Tuskegee Airmen to come in and be escort. 
The fact is that the Tuskegee Airmen were among about five or six other fighter groups that did escort, and we did it very well. Some of the fighter groups did leave the bombers to chase the enemy, but not all of them. Most of them were good fighter groups. Right. But we flew very close to the bombers, about 1,500 feet above them, and they could actually see us. And because of the red tails, the tails of the plane were painted red and the silver Mustangs that showed out, and they, they began to know about us. Uh, most of the pilots did not know that we were African American, but there was a uh, newspaper called the Stars and Stripes that came out every day. It was the official uh, military newspaper that began to talk about the all Negro fighter group, and they began to know about us. And then sometimes they'd run into us in Foggia or Naples, and they would talk to us. Um, some in the movie shows a scene where they didn't want African Americans to enter an officers club. Uh, that did happen, but the USO the service of you could go there. You would not be overly welcome. But eventually, when you, they saw who we were, they would come over and talk to us. There was not much mingling between the fighter groups anyway, but there was practically little mingling between the black fighters and the white fighters. And then, I mean, the movie sort of suggests this in a couple of scenes, the, the entrenched racism of the War Department and a lot of the military personnel that you had to overcome as well. And the War Department in 1925 did a study called the Utilization of Negro Troops. And their conclusion was that African Americans didn't have the intellectual ability, the coordination, the ability to follow orders to be fighter pilots or to be in combat units. And that was the uh, rule of the Air Force from 1925 all the way to 1940. And that's why the black press, the NAACP, and the Pullman Car Porters Union threatened to march on Washington right. that said that we want blacks to be able to be in combat units, particularly the Air Force, but we also want them to get equal pay in the defense industry. And that was the beginning of affirmative action. Well, and then what struck me by reading the story was that Eleanor Roosevelt is instrumental in this because she goes in an airplane and flies with one of the Tuskegee pilots. Well, actually, she flew with our chief instructor pilot when it was before the Tuskegee Airmen actually started. Oh, okay. In 1939, because of the pressure of the Congress, particularly Harry Truman, they established a training program, civilian pilot training program, at five or six black colleges. And she went to Tuskegee for a board meeting of the Rosenwald Foundation. And she heard that they were flying, and she went out to this air base, to airfield, to see what they were doing. And she met Alfred Anderson, who was the chief instructor pilot. And she said, I understand you Negroes want to learn to fly. Would you mind taking me for a ride? And so he took her for a half an hour ride. Fortunately, a reporter took a picture of it, and it went into all the newspapers all over the country. And that added emotional support for the Tuskegee Airmen uh, with the imprimatur of the president's wife. Wow. So you're watching the, the, the battle scenes, the, 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 the uh, dogfights in the sky. In one sense, was it an eye-opener to you to actually see what it might have looked at like in a global sense rather than from your perspective as a pilot? Well, actually, the uh, air to air is a lot closer than we were. The air to air shows them right behind each other. Sometimes we right behind them, but most of the time we'd probably be about 100 or 200 feet away going okay. at a deflection angle. But the bullets were there. They did come at you, and the planes did come past Oof. you. And when there's a dogfight, the plane's all over the place. And Lucas did an excellent job of presenting that. And that last scene where the jet gets shot down is absolutely outstanding. That, not only is it outstanding, but it's an accurate, but talk about it. Talk about shooting down a well, German jet, sir. Uh, well, when I shot down the jet, he wasn't coming straight at me. Uh, I was flying over the bombers, and the jet was coming up here toward the bombers, and I went down did a reverse split S, went down under the bombers, away from the jets, and then turned into his blind spot. And with an electronic gun set, I put the lead and boom, blew him up. Which well, what, what did you feel like? Well, it's like hitting a home run in the World Series because that's what you've been trained to do. Uh, we knew we could do it. The maneuver I did, I had practiced many, many times. 
So it's just like when a quarterback makes a pass in the Super Bowl, he's already done that a thousand times beforehand. It just so happened he does it when it's on the line, and I shot down the jet when it was on the line. Oh, talk about 2012. You talked about that you wanted African Americans and 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 others to see this film to, to to learn what happened and to experience it and see about excellence. Look what what is what is the world in 2012 compared to the world of 1944 and how where are we as a country in terms of race right now? Well, 2012 is clearly different from 1945. Right. Racial segregation has ended. There are opportunities they can't officially tell you that we're not going to hire blacks, you can get in the move. Unfortunately, uh, the Great Society was started by Lyndon Johnson that brought scholarships and support and food stamps and so on, is being challenged. And uh, the state of black America now is probably as bad as it was at the end of the 70s. I was reading a study the other day that said that the black, average black family owns, earns only 58% of the average white family. Uh, that 25% of black children grew up in poverty. That's down somewhat from previously 35, but right. still that's too many. And unfortunately, some of the black youth internalize these beliefs that they can't get ahead and indulge in certain social behaviors that are not particularly productive, like not thinking is smart. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've developed as a mantra around this movie for black youth in particular it's cool to be smart. The Tuskegee Emma are obviously very cool, but obviously if they weren't smart, they couldn't have done what they did. So we hope that will penetrate because there are some subtle barriers in terms of the way in which teachers approach them, in terms of the way in which they approach each other, in terms of the rewards that are given for athletics over the awards that are given for uh, academics. Uh, many prestigious colleges will accept an African-American who doesn't write very well because he's an athlete, but if he were a regular student, they wouldn't accept him and wouldn't give him the support. Those are the kind of things that I'm working on. That's the kind of things we ought to be concerned about today. And you're both cool and smart. And if you want to know more about the Tuskegee Airmen and, and Red Tails, start with the Wikipedia entry and then go to the NPR interview with Roscoe Brown and Tavis Smiley's PBS interview with Terrence Howard. Again, my thanks to Dr. Roscoe Brown for joining me today and for being you, for your service to your country, for your service to CUNY, and being a friend. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.